Hello everyone. The Bainbridge Island Museum of Art proudly presents Momentum 2021 and tonight's special guest, Amy Gulick. I'd like to begin our event today by reading a brief land acknowledgement. We acknowledge the land on which we gather is within the Aboriginal territory of the Suquabsh people of clear salt water, expert fishers, canoe builders, and basket weavers. The Suquabsh live in harmony with the land and waterways along Washington Central Salish Sea as they have for thousands of years. Here, the Suquabsh live and protect the land and waters of their ancestors for future generations as promised by the Point Elliott Treaty of 1855. We pay respects to their elders past and present. This year's Momentum Festival is centered on exploring the natural world featuring online presentations, discussions, and concerts. To see the full lineup and get more information, visit biartmuseum.org. I'll drop that link in the chat as well. And RSVP on event pages and we'll send you reminders um, and direct presentation links before each event. Momentum is a PRISM program of BIMA. PRISM is a cultural catalyst delivering intimate curated performances, presentations, and cultural celebrations that explores the personal connection between artists and audience. BIMA thanks our generous supporters, the city of Bainbridge Island, and Kitsap County. Without further ado, please help me welcome Amy Gulick. I'll stop sharing. Um, <laughs> Amy brings 25 years of experience uh, photo photographing and writing about nature to audiences ranging from the World Wilderness Congress to school classrooms. With science, humor, and adventure, Amy helps people understand ecological connections and why they matter to humanity and all life on Earth. Without further ado, Amy. Oh, great. Thank you, Annika. And hi, everyone. And thank you for tuning in tonight. And a big thanks to the Bainbridge Island Museum of Art for uh, making this whole event possible. Um, I still have to say that these these virtual events are still very strange for me. You know, I'm sitting here in my home by myself, you know, not knowing kind of who's out there and who's tuning in. Um, I much prefer to be with all of you in person, but this is the next best thing uh, and I'll take it. Um, any, any connection right now is, uh, I think, uh, very welcome. Um, so before I start, um, I'd like to acknowledge that I live um, on the traditional homelands of the Snohomish, Tulalip, and Coast Salish uh, people in Washington's Puget Sound on uh, Whidbey Island. And um, I'd also like to acknowledge what has brought us together tonight, and that's salmon. Um, so I always like to give a big nod and a big thank you uh, to the salmon. Of course, you're going to be hearing uh, all about them uh, this evening. So as a writer and photographer, I tell real life stories. I don't make anything up. Um, I, don't, I don't do fiction. Um, but how do I decide which stories to pursue? Well, sometimes I read something or maybe I have a conversation or an experience that sparks my curiosity. And a number of years ago, I had a conversation with an Alaska native woman that I think really got me on the path to starting um, my latest book project, uh, which is The Salmon Way, which I'll be talking to you about tonight. And this conversation that I had with her, it is included in the book, and I'd like to read just a part of it uh, to you now. And uh, I'm going to give you something much more interesting to look at uh, than just my head while I read that. Of course, my phone rings, right? When I'm going to do that. <laughs> um, so... Uh, Annika, just a uh, thumbs up or Hunter, I just want to make sure you're seeing uh, the book cover. It looks yeah, great. Perfect. Okay. All right. Great. Okay. Stroking a thick white mountain goat hide placed next to a loom. I watch master weaver Terry Rothgar create a robe traditionally made from the animal's wool. 
Next to the hide are strips of spruce root, raw materials for her exquisite woven basket also on display. Terry tells stories about her clinket raven ancestors as her expert fingers weave a beautiful design. With such plentiful resources in your homeland, it's easy to see how your ancestors thrived, I say to Terry. And she stops what she's doing and she looks at me and she says, resources? Mountain goats and trees aren't resources. We have relationships with the goat and the tree. Since time immemorial, Terry says, her people have lived along the forested coast of what is today Southeast Alaska, rich with spruce and cedar trees, mountain goats, salmon, bears, ravens, and eagles. To make items using spruce root and cedar bark, the people carefully harvested the roots and bark so that the trees could continue to live. Today, weavers use the same harvesting techniques. They knew the optimal time of year to hunt the mountain goat, so the animal's coat was in the best condition. And in addition to mountain goat wool, they also used the hide, horns, and meat. I wonder how Terry's ancestors thousands of years ago had the foresight to harvest bark or roots so as not to kill the trees. The forest must have seemed endless and in a constant state of regeneration in the soggy climate. But this mindfulness speaks to the difference between resources and relationships. When people live with deep connections to the land, water, animals, and plants that sustain them, it's impossible not to respect and develop relationships with trees, goats, salmon, and more. Resources, on the other hand, tend to refer to end products, commodities. It's tough to have a relationship with lumber, copper tubing, or frozen fish sticks. So I think it was really that chance encounter and that brief conversation with Terry about relationships that really sparked a lot of questions in my mind. And that's really usually how a story starts for me with questions. So here's a question for all of you. If I asked you what your relationship with salmon is, what would you say? And what kind of a question is that? What is your relationship with salmon? Well, it's the question that compelled me to go to Alaska and to show up at the homes, boats, and fish camps of complete strangers. I was intrigued that there's still a place in the world where the lives of people and salmon are linked. And I wanted to know what the lives of people are like who have relationships with these remarkable fish. So after years of asking Alaskans this question, I came back with the stories and photographs that you'll find in my book, uh, The Salmon Way. And I'm gonna highlight just a few of them here tonight. Um, I do encourage you to uh, get a hold of the book, whether you buy it, uh, borrow it from the library, um, because there's so many other heartfelt stories included in the book that I don't have time um, to share all of them with you tonight. Um, I'm very grateful to the people uh, who opened their homes and hearts to me and have allowed me to share their stories with you. So, where to start? Well, here's a rather mind boggling map of the state of Alaska that documents close to 20,000 streams, rivers, and lakes, shown here in blue, where you can find salmon. Now, keep in mind that this number is believed to represent only a fraction of the waters actually used by salmon. And keep in mind that Alaska is enormous. It's more than twice the size of the state of Texas. So I'd like to point out a few places that I'll be talking about tonight so that you can orient yourself. So Bristol Bay uh, in Southwest Alaska, that entire watershed there that drains into Bristol Bay, that's about the size of the state of Kentucky. Uh, over here, this is Southeast Alaska. This is about the size of the state of West Virginia and it contains important uh, transboundary rivers, the Taku, the Stikine and the Eunuch. And when I say transboundary, I mean that they originate in Canada, in this case in British Columbia, and they drain into the United States through Alaska. And then up here, this is the Yukon Kuskokwim River Delta. Um, this is one of the largest river deltas in the entire world. Um, it's that just the delta alone is about the size of the state of Louisiana. And uh, two rivers, the Kuskokwim and the Yukon, uh, drain into this delta. And it's important to note that the Yukon River is 2,000 miles long. It's the third longest river in North America. It's also transboundary, originating in Canada. Uh, draining into the United States. So when I look at this map, what I see 
is a living landscape, a beating heart whose arteries of life are all of those blue waterways. What you can't see on this map are the salmon pulsing through those waterways, bringing life to bears, birds, plants, people, and communities. Everywhere I went, Alaskans told me that salmon are their lifeblood. So salmon start their lives in fresh water, then they head out to the ocean to mature. And if all goes well, they return to the freshwater birth streams as adults to spawn the next generation. And then they die. That is the life cycle of Pacific salmon. So in between the beginning and the end of their lives, a lot can happen. And at the end of their, their lives, they pass something on to the next generation. Not unlike us, right? In between the beginning and end of our lives, a lot can happen. And what do we pass on? Can salmon teach us something about ourselves? So when you start poking your nose into people's relationships, you never know what you might learn. In the native village of Napai Mute, I poke my head inside the low doorway of a smokehouse. It's dim with a smoky haze, but the bright orange flesh of salmon illuminates and fills the space. Shelly Leary is hanging salmon strips on double hung racks. And she tells me, I was taught to always be ready to have food for the winter. I feel poor when I don't have food put up. When the smokehouse is filled, I feel good because I know I have enough. So it's mid June and among the season's first salmon, we speak in lowered voices, respectful of the bounty before us. The aroma of smoked fish permeates my skin, clothing and the pleasure center of my brain. I feel a great sense of comfort here, and I'm not really sure why. Never having to think too much about where my food comes from or the possibility of its scarcity, how could I begin to understand Shelley's feeling of well-being that comes with a full smokehouse? So we're on the Kuskokwim River, 255 miles upstream from its mouth. The village population here of less than 100 is seasonal, with most people, including Shelley's family, arriving when the salmon do. The rest of the year, she lives downriver in Bethel, population about 6,000, accessible only by airplane or boat. So she tells me a story of when she was in Seattle uh, for a few days. A friend from Alaska was with her and they walked around the big city looking at all the tall buildings and the crowds of people. And she says, we wondered what all of those people would do when something bad happened. What would all of those people eat? We were glad we were going home soon. And this is home for Shelly. This is just a very small snippet of that entire uh, Yukon Kuskokwim River Delta. So that's the difference between my and Shelly's comfort derived from her full smokehouse. Mine is immediate gratification, delicious food in a warm, cozy place right now. Hers is long-term security, food for the winter, like money in the bank. I live under the delusion that there will always be food, even though I'm not growing, fishing, hunting, or even storing much of it. Shelly lives under no such pretense. Who is the wiser? Who is rich? How do you define wealth? So Shelly is Ingalik, an Alaska native, and she and her family are among the 18% of Alaskans considered subsistence users of Alaska's fish and wildlife. And for thousands of years, Alaska natives have fished, hunted, and gathered as a way of life. Today, approximately 130,000 rural residents, both natives and non-natives, still rely on fish and wildlife, harvesting on average close to 300 pounds per person a year. And fish account for more than half of this amount. It's really important to note there's no other place in the United States wild and abundant enough that a significant number of people can still live this way. So most of us, we're thousands of years removed from the ways of our hunter-gatherer ancestors. So today's concept of subsistence in Alaska, it's often misunderstood. The word itself implies a meager existence, but most Alaskans who live this way of life consider themselves rich people. And they fight, they fight hard to maintain the right to continue their customary and traditional ways. Now, an outsider like me could see this as a food security issue, but I've come to learn that it is much more than that. It's about people whose identities, cultures, and connections to the land, waters, their ancestors, elders, children, and each other revolve around fishing, hunting, gathering, sharing, and respecting food and where it comes from, and teaching the next generations to do the same. Salmon bring people together. They keep people together. 
three generations of this family gather at their fish camp on the Kuskokwim River. So let's meet another family. Um, this one is from Juneau in Southeast Alaska, whose three generations gather because of salmon. So Heather Hardcastle, she's standing there in the middle uh, wearing the yellow suspenders. And she tells me that her fondest childhood memory is riding in a skiff in the long twilight of an Alaska summer evening. With salt spray and the smell of spruce trees in the air, the boat whisked her to see spawning salmon near the Taku River. And she tells me, I'll never forget the joy I felt dragging my hands through the water, touching the backs of all those beautiful fish as sheer granite peaks towered over us. Heather's parents, uh, Pete and Sheila, they're there on the left. They fished the Taku River and they sold salmon commercially in the summers. And they brought young Heather, her brother and the family dog along on their boat uh, named the Heather Ann. Heather says she grew up eating salmon every day in every way, baked, boiled in burgers, salads, and even pie. It wasn't until she left Alaska to attend college in North Carolina that she fully appreciated the abundance of salmon that still exists in her home state and the way of life it allows commercial fishermen to live. Heather's husband, Kirk, is sitting in front of her with their daughter, uh, Kielly. Uh, Kirk grew up in a culture in Northern California that uh, revolves around high quality locally produced cuisine. So when he came to Alaska and he began to fish commercially with Heather's dad, he quickly saw the potential to bring superb fish directly to restaurants, specialty markets, and consumers who wanted that direct connection with their food and the fishermen. So together with two friends, uh, Renee and Winston on the right there, they're with their daughter, uh, Athena, they formed uh, Taku River Reds. This is a company that prides itself on honoring both the fish and the fishermen by providing high quality wild Alaska salmon and supporting a way of life for fishing families. So Heather in her spare time, she advises an international coalition. It's called Salmon Beyond Borders. And it works to conserve her home stream, the Taku River, along with other transboundary salmon rivers that straddle the United States-Canada border. And she says to me, these rivers are our lifeblood. My dad has always said to evaluate any proposed activity or development through the lens of salmon. Whatever is good for salmon is going to be good for the environment, community, and economy. Now, I've been fortunate to spend time with Heather's family, sharing delicious salmon, laughter, and hopes for the future. Grateful for the life that salmon have given them, Heather and Kirk are raising their daughter, Kielly, on salmon every day in every way. And in the long twilight of summer near the Taku River, they ride by skiff to the place where the salmon and their family have always gathered. So for thousands of years, people have always gathered where there are salmon. In Bristol Bay in Southwest Alaska, the annual return of the world's largest run of sockeye salmon triggered a great migration of native people who came for the seasonal bounty and to renew ties with family and friends. Today, the migration of both salmon and people continues in Bristol Bay, home for the past century to a thriving commercial fishery. People come for the seasonal bounty and to renew ties with family and friends. Melanie Brown, she's on the left there in red. She's migrated with her family to Bristol Bay every one of her 50 summers. Melanie is Alaska native. Her ancestors are Yupik, Aleut, and Inupiaq. She inherited her great grandfather's commercial fishing site near the Naknak River. This is one of nine major rivers that feeds into Bristol Bay. Now there are two ways to commercial fish in Bristol Bay, set netting and drift netting. Melanie is a set netter. Set netters fish close to shore from a fixed location and many use skips to help them set and, and uh, pull in the net. Drift netters, they use much larger boats and they can fish anywhere within the legal boundaries so they can move around. Now, some set netters don't use boats at all and they fish from the beach. So everything is done by hand and, and it's really just your body out there. As one beach set netter told me, most of the time it's plain, hard, miserable work in the cold, in the wind, in the rough waters, in the rain, in the mud, with bugs, little sleep, and a proper nourishment for days on end. So the Bristol Bay fishery is extremely intense. Why? Well, an enormous volume of salmon pulses into the bay in a very short period of time. Since the 1960s, an average of 33 million fish return every year. The season I visited, close to 60 million fish return. Now, most salmon runs in Alaska happen over the course of about four to six weeks, but here, 
80 to 90% of that run comes in just 20 days with salmon showing up in mass and limited hours to catch them. It's all hands on deck and sleep isn't something that one can afford to do much. So for Melanie, she's there in the middle. Commercial fishing in Bristol Bay, it's a business, but it's rooted in family. Her dad captains his own drift boat, her sister's family fishes their own set net site, and Melanie and her mother, and her mother's there on the left, and her mother's in her 70s, they fish their two set net sites together. And Melanie's uh, daughter, Mari, who's on the right, she was 14 uh, the season I visited, and she had just started to fish uh, with the family that season. And Melanie says to me, I feel like I'm living a legacy, a continuation of a river flowing in time. The Knack Knack is my family's home stream and I'm grateful for the life that it has given us for so long. I want that to continue for my children and their descendants. So I spent a day on Melanie's skiff watching just how physically demanding set netting can be. Everything on Melanie's boat is muscle power. There's no mechanical gear. So you set, pull, pick the net, repeat for six to eight hours, try to get some rest in between fishing openings and do it all again the next tide and the next until the season ends. At the end of the day, Melanie invites me to the family home for a dinner of moose spaghetti and birthday cake for her eight-year-old son, Oliver. I ask everyone in the family, you know, what does salmon mean to you? The answers come rapid fire. Food, home, family, opportunity, education, blessing, work ethic. Melanie tells me that when she was young, she started asking fundamental questions. I think questions we all start asking at some point, like what's the meaning of life and why are we here? And she says, there are certain events that mark our lives and at the end, that's it. But there's the hope that we're passing something on too. You look at salmon and how much they pass on, not only to their offspring, but to the whole system that they're a part of and benefit. I think a human who has lived life well does that too. So we've seen how salmon benefit people who catch and sell them for their livelihood and people who rely on them for a substantial part of their diet and their culture. Well, they also benefit people who make a living as sport fishing guides. John Yeager, he's on the right. Uh, he lives in Wrangell near the mouth of the transboundary Stikine River in Southeast Alaska. He takes people on his boat to fish for salmon in the ocean and he says, I'm not so much trying to fill the freezers of my clients. I'm trying to fill their minds with memories. There are many firsts on my boat. First time in Alaska, first time catching a salmon, or first time fishing with a grandchild. I like that I can provide experiences that will stay with people forever. So John grew up in a small town in Ohio and his family owned a grocery store. He tells me that when he was young, if he wanted ice cream or T-bone steaks, he'd just go to the family store and grab what he needed. There was no exchange of money and he never really understood where food came from or what it took to get it. But when he came to Alaska, he married into a family that homesteaded on the Stikine River and fishes and hunts as a way of life. And he says, living the way we do in Alaska, I think a lot about food, especially salmon. When my family catches the salmon, we give some to my wife's parents and to an elderly neighbor. And then we share the rest together. We've done the job the fish wanted us to do with it. That's important. It's not just the sustenance of the fish, it's the spirit of the fish. Heidi Wild, she's shown here with her 14 year old son, Lane. She's a sport fishing guide in Bristol Bay and she takes clients all over this immense region to fish for salmon and trout. So she guides March through October. And so she sees salmon at both the beginning and the end of their lives. And she says, the moment that salmon eggs hatch, the fight to survive and thrive is on. The fish make their way to the ocean and they face limitless perils. They stay gone until they're called home. They don't quit swimming in the middle of their return home simply because they faced obstacles. They keep moving forward, tirelessly, devoted, inspiring, just like most of us. So Heidi, myself, and two others, we fly in a small float plane soaring over the vast tundra with its countless creeks, lakes, and rivers. It's late August, and while the frenzy of the Bristol Bay commercial fishing season for people ended in mid-July, the frenzy of the spawning season for salmon is in full swing in the many tributaries upstream from the mouth of the bay. The pilot lands on a lake, and we hike to a creek jammed with tomato red sockeye nearing the end of their lives. But we are not here for the salmon. We are here because of salmon. 
Rainbow and Dolly Varden trout grow big and fat here, feasting on salmon eggs, salmon carcasses, and young salmon that emerge in the spring. So we cross the creek and a wall of crimson sockeye opens and streams along both sides of us. The water sings with the riffles of the shallows and the ripples of the salmon swaying in the current. We cast into the water, into our minds, fishing for whatever this way comes. Few words are exchanged. The shared connection to the land, the fish, and the crisp air bonds us together better than words ever could. Time slows. What matters is what's happening now, not what happened years ago or what might happen tomorrow. Heidi peers toward the bank of the creek and she says, is that a bear? My inner calm is disrupted by her voice, but all that matters is what's happening now. And what's happening now is that a bear has come between our group, not an ideal scenario, and one that we've been very careful to avoid all day. So he creeps into the creek and he turns broadside to us. This is a polite and rather effective way of intimidating his neighbors by showing us his size. So we give the bear space and he ambles upstream a little way, stops, and he turns broadside again. I think maybe he's telling us that we've overstayed our welcome in his dining room. So we clump together and we splash across the creek, salmon bodies thrash against our legs, our boots hit dry ground, and we begin to scramble up a steep bank, bashing through a wall of willows. Finally, we reach the top. And then the laughter begins. Laughter at the bushwhack up the bank, laughter at ourselves for fleeing the scene, and laughter because it's exhilarating to be in this staggeringly beautiful place, sharing this world-class moment with new friends. So bears and salmon go together, and so do many other species that salmon benefit. At every stage of their life cycle, salmon are a life force that feeds something. The salmon circle of life radiates to support at least 50 different species in Alaska. You spend enough time around salmon and you realize that they're in everything. They're in bears, birds, marine mammals, and people. They're even in trees. And I hope you're scratching your heads and you're asking, well, how does this happen? Is this salmon in, in the trees? Well, no, technically this is salmon up a tree. So how the heck does salmon get in the trees? Well, in the great salmon forest of the Tongass National Forest in Southeast Alaska, scientists have found high concentrations of a nitrogen variant in trees near salmon streams. This variant is called nitrogen 15 and it comes from the ocean. So how did it find its way from the sea into the forest? Well, it swam there in the bodies of spawning salmon loaded with marine nutrients from their time at sea. But then how exactly does it get into the trees? Well, bears have a lot to do with this. Now bears don't really like being around other bears. So when they catch a fish, they will often carry it away from the stream and into the woods. Turns out that bears can move a lot of salmon into the forest. Researchers say that one bear can carry 40 fish from a stream in just eight hours. Now toward the end of a good salmon season, bears can afford to be picky and they usually target the richest parts of the fish and they leave the rest behind. Other animals scavenge on these carcasses. This spreads the nutrients farther throughout the forest. Well, guess what happens? All of this rich fish fertilizer decomposes into the soil and the trees and other vegetation absorb it through their roots. Scientists have actually traced nitrogen 15 in trees near salmon streams that links directly back to the fish. And that is how salmon end up in the trees. Now, how cool is that? Well, it's so cool. I did an entire book on this topic called, what else? Salmon in the Trees. Now for this book, The Salmon Way, a lot of people have asked me how I made this cover photo. Um, this is not photoshopped at all. This is the real deal. What you're looking at is what I saw through the viewfinder in my camera. So I had this idea in my mind that I wanted to make a photograph that spoke to the concept of salmon as a life force. But this is difficult to capture and show when the salmon are still alive because they don't stay alive very long once they're caught. So somehow I needed to make a photograph of a live vibrant salmon providing life for something else. And to do this, I went to McNeil River. This is on the northeast side of the Alaska Peninsula. Now there's a story in the book about my time at McNeil River and I'd like to read uh, just a part of it to you now. Weighing more than half a ton, a bear named Rocky ambles toward me. He has scars on his face and shoulders and tattered skin on his sides. He's a fighter, hence his name, and he's healthy. His belly almost scrapes the ground. His enormous head melds into his massive girth and each paw is bigger than my head. He's hungry. 
Fortunately for Rocky and me, there's a river full of fish, just steps from where he stands and I sit at the McNeil River State Game Sanctuary. Established in 1967, the 200 square mile sanctuary is protected wildlife habitat and home to the world's largest congregation of brown bears. As many as 144 individuals have been identified in a single summer with 74 bears observed at one time. From early July through mid-August, chum salmon return to the McNeil River to spawn. A mile upstream from the river's mouth, the McNeil River Falls create a salmon traffic jam, providing excellent fishing opportunities for bears and outstanding bear viewing experiences for humans. And that's why I'm here, along with nine other lucky homo sapiens who won four-day bear viewing permits in a lottery system through the Alaska Department of Fish and Game. Now, if it weren't for salmon, we wouldn't be here. If it weren't for salmon, people who came to McNeil long before it was designated a wildlife sanctuary probably wouldn't have been here either. The camp where we pitched our tents is pocked with shallow depressions in the ground, evidence of semi-subterranean dwellings of people who were most likely nomadic. I can envision them arriving in the summer to harvest salmon. Perhaps they took steam baths fueled by driftwood from the beach, not far from today's wood-fired sauna overlooking a lily pond. They would have shared food, chores, and laughter, not unlike us, sharing peanut butter, hauling water, and swapping stories. While they didn't come here to watch bears, they undoubtedly viewed them with respect. Everything we do, eat, sleep, walk, and talk, is done with respect for the bears and their home. We sit quietly near the Roaring River. Rocky faces the falls in solid defiance of the oncoming water, tumbling over the boulders and swirling past his legs. He darts his head into the churning water and emerges triumphant with a flopping fish. It's a female, and as the clamp of the big Bruin's teeth forces the eggs from her body, in that moment, her life force is transferred to his. Watching the age-old scene of predator pursuing prey in a setting devoid of roads, motorized vehicles, crowds of people, or cell phone coverage triggers something deep within us. That wild part of our DNA, long dormant, awakens from its domesticated slumber. Places like McNeil Sanctuary make us feel alive, not because we're seeking a thrill, but because what we didn't know we were missing reintroduces itself. Connecting to our true nature makes us whole. So I think that many people are drawn to salmon. I know that I am because in salmon, we see a bit of ourselves. Salmon show all who encounter them that life is a, a dance of rhythms, balance, and strength. Through twists and turns, ups and downs, we learn to trust the unseen and bow with grace for the time we are here. From the fish, we learn what it means to be a part of the world, what it means to be human, what it means to be. Salmon are a gift. I heard this over and over again. They're a gift to the land, water, animals, plants, and people. And when you're on the receiving end of a gift, you give thanks and you give back. It's the salmon way. Everywhere I went from remote villages to urban cities, whether I met with people for 10 minutes or 10 days, I always seem to leave with salmon in my hands. I was so touched by the generosity that the salmon people showed me. I learned that sharing is the Alaska way and that it goes beyond food and includes sharing things like firewood, laughter, sweat, and tears. This generosity of spirit forges relationships and relationships create communities. Throughout my travels, I asked another question. What would your life be like without salmon? Pretty much everyone gave me the same answer. Without salmon, there would be no community. That's what salmon do. They connect us to each other, to a home stream, and to our true nature. Emma Lakaitis, she's a young commercial fisherman from Homer, and she says, salmon have given all Alaskans a common language, a set of values, something to believe in and hope for. Reuben Hastings, he's a young Alaska native sport fishing guide from Bristol Bay, and he says, watching salmon, you see that life isn't just a straight line that ends at the finish line. Both Emma and Ruben hope that their generation and beyond can continue the salmon way of life. Now for many Alaskans who don't make their living from salmon or live a subsistence way of life, their connection to salmon runs deep, catching their own fish and sharing the bounty with others because food always tastes best when it's shared. Now I wish more than anything that I could live this salmon way of life right here where I live in Washington state. And had I been born, oh, maybe 80, 100 years ago, I probably could have. Now, when I look at this map, I feel both pain 
and hope. Now, much of the hope lies north in Alaska, but let's talk about the pain first. The once staggering runs of salmon in Northern California, Oregon, Washington, Idaho, and Southern British Columbia, they're now less than just 10% of their historical abundance. How did this happen? Well, beginning in the late 1700s, an increasingly industrial way of life systematically decimated salmon and their habitat, creek by creek, river by river. A culture that valued short-term profits and commodities dominated cultures that valued long-term relationships with their natural communities. Damming rivers to power factories and energy grids, dumping toxic waste in the waterways, diverting water from rivers to irrigate crops, overfishing and deforestation. These are just a handful of the crimes against salmon that led to their demise. Now, plenty of people objected to all of this, but the voices of those who stood for salmon were steamrolled. When the salmon vanished, entire ways of life went with them. The gift of salmon was largely gone and the relationships, communities, and cultures were largely lost. So this is the Columbia River. This is 66 miles from its mouth along the border of Washington and Oregon. The 1200 mile Columbia River, this was once one of the greatest salmon producing systems on earth. Like many of the lower 48 rivers where salmon once thrived, we lost salmon in the Columbia due to overharvest, habitat destruction, hydroelectric dams, and substituting hatcheries for habitat. At 146 miles from the mouth of the Columbia is the Bonneville Dam. This is the first of many built on this river system. At the dam's visitor center, there's an exhibit that talks about dam construction and what it brought to the region. There's one sign in particular in the exhibit that stands out to me. What is wealth, living, and happiness? And who decides? The native people whose entire way of life was connected to this free flowing river, who gathered for millennia for the seasonal bounty of salmon and to renew ties with family and friends. How would they define wealth, living, and happiness? When we overfished, dammed, and polluted the mighty Columbia, we traded one form of wealth for another. We traded a way of life for another. We may have gained, but we also lost. A river without its salmon is a river without its soul. And this story has repeated itself most everywhere in the world where there were once salmon on both sides of the Pacific and the Atlantic Oceans. Now, let's talk about hope. You've seen how the salmon people of Alaska define wealth, living, and happiness. A full smokehouse, a connection to a home stream and community, gathering with family and friends, sharing the seasonal bounty and passing all of this to the next generations. There is a strong belief among Alaska natives that if they respect the salmon, the fish will come back every year and give themselves to the people. I think that's the basis for any healthy relationship, respect. We want these salmon relationships to continue. We have to continue to respect salmon and give them what they need, clean, cool, healthy, fresh water to spawn and rear and a thriving ocean to mature. So I'd like to highlight a, a couple people who are working to ensure that salmon have a future in Alaska. This is Sue Mauger. She's a stream ecologist and the science director for Cook Inlet Keeper. This is an organization that works to conserve the Cook Inlet watershed and the life it supports. So in 2008, Sue and the Cook Inlet Keeper, they coordinated a team of state and federal agencies as well as nonprofit and community groups to create and implement a stream temperature monitoring network in the Cook Inlet watershed. And they've expanded this work um, beyond to uh, Bristol Bay watershed as well. So as cold-blooded creatures, salmon depend on the water temperature of their environment for the regulation of their body temperature. And Sue helped me understand that what happens to the fish when water temperatures rise, something that occurred uh, in the summer of 2019 with record temperatures throughout Alaska, and something that we may see more of in the future with a changing climate. So Sue told me that water temperatures above 55 degrees Fahrenheit bring increasing stress to salmon, Above 68 degrees, the fish are less likely to avoid predators and successfully spawn. And at 77 degrees and higher, they don't have the energy to spawn and survive the freshwater phase of their life. So understanding which streams across an entire landscape are prone to warming and which are likely to remain unchanged will help land and salmon managers prioritize conservation strategies to increase the resiliency of salmon to a changing climate. This is absolutely critical work. 
Ted Otis, he's there on the left. He's a research biologist with the Alaska Department of Fish and Game. And I spent time with him and uh, other folks within the department to get an idea of what they do to manage salmon. I learned just how much information and data is behind any decision to allow or restrict fishing. Things like fish forecasts, test fisheries, escapement reports, genetic analyses, historical rec records, and much more. Now, Ted helped me understand that Alaska still has abundant salmon runs because the habitat remains largely intact. He also stressed how important genetic diversity is to salmon, and he cited Bristol Bay as a great example of diverse salmon habitat that fosters stability within and across salmon populations, helping them to be much more resilient to any kind of environmental change. And the time I spent throughout the state with the men and women of fish and game made me realize that they often work in challenging conditions, sometimes quite dangerous, and it can be a thankless job at times. But every met, everyone I met was passionate about making sure that Alaska is a place where there will always be salmon to catch. And in fact, Alaska is one of the few places left in the world where salmon can still thrive where salmon people live connected to the fish with an appreciation for what nourishes both body and spirit. And while I set out to tell stories in my book that celebrate the salmon way, there is also a cautionary tale to tell. Bristol Bay, home to the world's largest run of sockeye salmon is threatened by the proposed pebble mine. If built, this mine will be the world's largest open pit gold mine situated at the headwaters of two of the most important rivers that feed Bristol Bay. The transboundary rivers in Southeast Alaska are threatened by pollution from current and proposed Canadian mining operations. And in some parts of the state, there are salmon runs that are in decline, including those of the Kuskokwim and Yukon rivers uh, for reasons that aren't entirely understood. And there are always new proposals to dam, dredge and degrade more salmon habitat, including building new roads in the Tongass National Forest in Southeast Alaska, where there are still salmon in the trees. But Alaska is a place where history doesn't have to repeat itself, where salmon still endure, where we have an incredible opportunity to leave a salmon-filled legacy. Now, throughout my travels, I asked everyone I met how he or she values salmon. Not a single person responded with financial figures. Instead, all of the answers spoke to the relationship instead of the resource. And it didn't matter if the people I asked the question to fish for their food, livelihood or fun, everybody gave me the same answers. The value of salmon, family, community, culture, well-being, and way of life. These are values too precious to reduce to dollars and cents and senseless to try. So today is we're celebrating and defending that Alaska is still a place where salmon are the lifeblood, where the salmon way is still a way of life. And so I dedicate this talk and my book to the salmon people. May your lives always pulse with the beauty and mystery of your home streams. And to the salmon, may you always come home. And to all of you, I leave you with the greatest lesson that salmon have taught me. Life short, be a life force with the time you're given and give it everything you've got. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Uh, I would just like to open up um, the Q&A portion of this presentation. So for those of you who are on Zoom, you can use the Q&A feature um, at the bottom of your toolbar there. Uh, Bima is really excited to welcome you to this presentation and to share these stories, insights, and different perspectives and truths in order to ensure a positive experience for both our audience and presenters. We ask that you engage respectfully, ready to listen and open to all the learning that comes with it. I know that I personally have a few questions <laughs> for Amy. So maybe I'll start with those um, while you're coming up with some of your own. Uh, yeah, Tom asked, will this presentation be available for others after tonight? Yeah, this is um, a recorded presentation and we'll be posting it on the Bainbridge Island Museum of Art YouTube channel. Um, so you can send it out to anyone else you think might be interested there once we post it. 
the question, um, the first question that sort of came to mind for me is just, what do you think surprised you the most as you sort of began this adventure of writing The Salmon Way? Yeah, uh, thank you for asking that question. Um, I think what surprised me most, I, I think when, you know, when I set out, um, you know, to, to meet with salmon people and I really was trying to, to meet with the greatest diversity of peoples I possibly could. So Alaska native people who, again, entire cultures have been built on salmon and have, you know, lived on, on their home stream since time immemorial, commercial fishermen, um, you know, sport fishermen, uh, just kind of regular everyday people with maybe government jobs or, you know, kind of like a more, you know, regular job, but, you know, fill their freezer with salmon in the summer if they can. Um, I was really expecting everybody to give me very different answers when I asked them, what is your relationship with salmon? And I, so I think what surprised me as time went on and I met with more and more people, um, I was really surprised that really when I asked people that question, didn't really matter kind of who they were and what their background was and what their ideology was and what their worldview was. They were all really giving me very similar answers. You know, this family, community, uh, connection to the land, to the water. And I realized it's like, wow, those are, those are very basic universal human values. These are things we all want and we all need, right? We need a connection to a community. Um, we'd love to have a connection to uh, the land, you know, in some way, um, you know, anything that gathers and brings our family together and friends. Um, these, these are things we all need, you know, to live a fulfilling life. So I think that's really what surprised me most um, but then, you know, now, you know, after writing the book and, and, and photographing and telling these stories, you know, many times, it's like, well, of course, <laughs> you know, of, of course, that's what salmon mean to people. But it, it really did surprise me at first. Yeah, that's so interesting. The, the other question, and I think um, this is maybe relating a little more towards you and your personal experience is just that um, as you're sort of researching and learning all these stories connected to, to something that I think m many people associate with food in some way, did, did it affect how your own relationship to the things that you eat and how, how in your relationship to food and how you see it in your life, I guess? Yeah, wow. Another, another great question. Yes. Um, you know, I, I watched... Uh, and you know, I I, I spent I, I broke bread many times you know, with uh, with with people that I was meeting with. Of course, we were eating salmon, which I just adore. Um, but I really realized, you know, when when you live when you live with the with an abundance of something, um, and especially something like wild salmon that you didn't have to grow, you know, you didn't have to really herd, you know, you didn't have to follow, you didn't have to raise them in any way. They just show up um, year after year. And, and I mean, yes, there are slow years, um, you know, not every year is a gangbuster year, but in Alaska, for the most part, you know, they pretty much show up every year and they, and they fill people's freezers, they fill people's smokehouses. And so when you live with that kind of abundance for something, again, that you didn't have to grow or really do anything, um, other than respect them, um, um, you 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 get this incredible generosity in your spirit, and you want to share that abundance. And so, for me, you know, when I would come back home after you know spending a lot of time with people, um, you know, sharing, you know, sharing their hard-earned riches with me, and I'll say hard-earned because it's not easy necessarily catching those salmon and and cutting them and smoking them, it's its very time consuming, but it's also very enjoyable. Um, and most people I met really do enjoy living that way of life. So when I came back here after, again, really feeling that sense of community and, and the, uh, that salmon make possible and that sharing makes possible, really started looking at my own life. And it's like, okay, what, what do I have in abundance? Um, and, um, uh, you know, I, I'm fortunate I have um, uh, an orchard, you know, I have apple trees and I have some fruit trees. And so in a bumper year, it's like, I am going to do everything I can, you know, to share those. I'm going to press them into cider. I'm going to make applesauce. And, and then I give that away, you know, I give that away to people. And I love doing it. And, you know, of course, they love receiving it right now where I live. The nettles um, are just going gangbuster. And, you know, a lot of people 
who have not eaten nettles or made tea out of them, you know, they maybe view nettles as a weed. Well, I view them as that's a source of wealth. And so I get out there and I, I harvest them, I dry them, I make tea. Um, I just sent, I just sent in the mail <laughs> fresh nettle leaves to my friends in Alaska who are still sitting, you know, with three feet of snow on the ground, you know, and so for them, that's a taste of spring that they don't have yet. So I, it, it is, again, thank you for asking that question because it, it, it has really, learning the salmon way of life and learning what it means to live in some kind of an abundance um, I'm much more cognizant of sharing um, any kind of abundance that I'm fortunate uh, to have. So we have a question from James, which is how do hatcheries and ocean ranching harm natural salmon populations? Great question. How much time do we all have? <laughs> um, well, down here in the lower 48, um, what, what we did with hatcheries here, we replaced uh, natural spawning habitat. We just decided that we were going to dam rivers, uh, pollute rivers, you know, dump toxins into them. And that, that destroyed a lot of uh, natural salmon habitat in their freshwater streams. And so we decided, well, you know, what, what can we do to kind of, you know, make up for that? And so we came up with the idea of building hatcheries. And so a hatchery is where, you know, you are raising uh, salmon um, for a little bit, um, you and then you release the once the eggs hatch and they they go through a, the couple stages of the life cycle. Then there's tiny little fish called a fry. Then you release the fry into you know near this hatchery and they with the hopes that they're going to go out in the ocean, grow big and strong, and then come back to this hatchery. And then you know the hatchery will then uh, uh, capture the eggs and, and the, the milk um, from the salmon and kind of start that process over again. Um, there's a lot of problems with that. Um, uh, you know, hatchery fish, um, they don't, because they're not born in their natural habitat, they're not really learning how to avoid predators. They're not, um, you know, some people kind of, I don't really like the term dumb fish, but they're just not as savvy. They're not as smart. They're not as strong. You know, to really go out into the ocean and 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 try and survive that phase of their life. Um, so uh, again, there's just, but but also, I actually really think that one of the most damaging thing of hatcheries is that it gets us into this mindset that we don't need natural habitat for salmon. It's like, oh well, we'll we'll just build a hatchery and we can get you know we can pollute the rivers and we can dam the rivers as long as we build a hatchery, and that really has not worked out you know, so well for us. So that's hatcheries. Um, there are salmon farms. Um, that is when the salmon are raised, you know, from the egg to the fry to the entire uh, adult sized fish um, in these net pens uh, in the water. These are incredibly uh, or can be incredibly damaging um, to the environment that they're in because those net pens are usually in the ocean in a bay. Um, think of it like as a concentrated feedlot where there's a lot of cattle all jammed into one, you know, area. Think of all the feces, you know, from the fish, the waste that's going to trickle down and smother, you know, the bottom of the of the bay there. Um, hatchery fish, or I'm sorry, farmed fish um, have a lot of problems with disease because they are being raised in this concentrated area. So they're usually fed, you know, maybe some kind of antibiotics. Um, the, a little known fact for those of you who are eating uh, 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 farm salmon, you might want to reconsider um, the the beautiful color uh, that I'm that I'm wearing. You know, salmon that flesh color. They get that. They get that color of their flesh from the food that they eat in the wild. Um, uh, farm fish do not get that because they're being fed pellets of some kind. And so, guess what? You know, when you see farm fish in the store, um, they are this color, but they're this color because they've been dyed. Um, with with food coloring of some kind, so it's a lot of lot of problems with farm salmon and and you know ocean ranching that, that kind of thing. So thank you for asking that question. It's a um, you know there there are entire papers and books written on this topic, and I hope that you you might explore those more. But but again, I really think the most damaging thing is this mindset that we get into that like we don't need habitat. We can just we can engineer our way out of this, and it's like mm, not really. 
We have another um, comment and question from Joseph, who is, thanks you for this presentation and asks, um, can you talk about salmon foods you experienced or were introduced to? What was surprising or different or unexpected or strange in terms of <laughs> salmon foods and preparations? Pie, what is that like? <laughs> salmon pie, right? Um, it's also called, uh, uh, the native people actually call it Russian pie because I think it was kind of the Russian Orthodox influence that came to their villages. Um, I think they started um, this, tradition of Russian pie. And it's basically, you know, you take a pie crust, just like you would a fruit pie, you take a pie crust and you layer it with like rice and vegetables and salmon, you know, and then put the crust on top. Um, so that, that would be salmon pie. I think probably um, for me, one of the, um, I wouldn't say strangest thing, but something I'd never had before uh, is uh, fish head. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm used to, uh, if, if I'm going to cut a salmon, I'm probably, or, not anymore, right? But <laughs> because I've learned, uh, particularly the native folks, and they do not waste anything. They do not waste a single part, you know, of the salmon. And and for the elders in particular, the head is the most prized part of the salmon. Um, um, a lot of elders would tell me, you know, they they would eat the brains, they would eat the eyes, um, and and that's their favorite part. So you know, for someone who's not used to that, it was a little strange. But of course, I'm always game, you know, to try things. Um, um, there's so, so yeah, the fish head itself, um, there's fish head soup, um, you know, where you're making a, a stock from, from boiled fish heads. Um, I think probably the, the hardest thing, uh, for me to kind of wrap my head around was I met a native woman who lives upstream from Bristol Bay. So she lives, uh, on Iliamna Lake and she's featured in the book, um, wonderful, uh, woman. Um, and again, I encourage you to, to get the book and read her story because I didn't even mention her uh, in this talk. And she was telling me, she said, have you ever heard of Noodlevi? And I said, mm, if I have, I, I don't know that I have. And she said, Noodlevi is, is her uh, Dena Enna um, Athabascan word uh, for spawn, spawning salmon. So because, so when they, when, by the time the salmon get to her, they've, they've left Bristol Bay, they've gone up the Quijack River, they've entered Iliam the lake, they're still silver when they get to her. But then as the season goes on, they turn into their spawning colors and they turn red and they're about to spawn. And even then the people would harvest them. And so to me, I was thinking, ah, you're harvesting rotten salmon. So that was, that was a hard one to wrap my head around. And she, she assured me, it's like, they're not rotten. They're just different. They're in a, just a very different stage. And she said, what we would do with them at this stage, we would, um, we would dry them. By, by the time we were harvesting them, the weather would be cool, it'd be cold, and we would just hang them out to dry in cold weather. And they would dry and uh, we would store them dried and then we'd eat them. And so I was very curious. I said, well, um, I would love to try some because I, I just want to make sure that in my head, they're not rotten fish. They are just a different form of, of the salmon at this point. And so later in the year, after she had prepared her, the noodle by, um, she brought me some and, and I was delightfully surprised. It was just, it just tasted like a much milder salmon, um, but of course didn't taste rotten at all. So that was just my, that was just my white palate and my white mindset, you know, kind of going, ew. <laughs> But again, I was so uh, impressed that, uh, again, particularly with the native folks, that they they use every every bit of the salmon and anything that maybe they don't eat, they would then feed to their dogs. You know, people traditionally had uh, dog teams to get around before um, the invention of the snowmobile. Um, so, and even today, people still keep dogs. Um, so, again, even the dogs eat very well <laughs> in the native communities. So another question was just, um, I appreciate you spot your sort of spotlighting of the people um, who are working to support salmon. And I'm wondering if you have any, um, you sort of talk, spoken on this a little bit, but what suggestions you have for individuals who might want to make sure that they're doing their part to um, support salmon and the, the, their important role in the ecosystem? Yeah, uh, thank you. Again, great, great question. Um, you know, I think the number one thing, you know, if we want salmon anywhere, whether it's Alaska, whether it's here in the lower 48, where we're working very hard to recover and restore salmon, and I, I should probably touch on that. It's not all doom and gloom here, but we are trying to restore and recover. 
Um, um, and again, and there have been some, some very good success stories uh, here in the lower 48, uh, as far as some dam removal and, and working towards that. But number one, salmon need habitat. They absolutely have to have habitat. Salmon are tough, they are hardy, they are resilient creatures. They have survived ice ages, drought, fire, um, you know, all kinds of you know, volcanic eruptions. Um, they keep coming back as long as they have what they need. And what they need is um, very healthy freshwater habitat. And so, and they need, so what, you know, what is that? It's cool, clear, clean, unobstructed, uh, river systems um, that they can spawn in and and you know grow before they head out to the ocean. They need the ocean to be very productive. The whole reason why salmon leave freshwater and go to the ocean is because that's where they find food, where they can grow big uh, and strong. So the ocean has to be productive um, and conducive, you know, to growing the food that they need. And then that freshwater has got to be uh, healthy and unobstructed um, for them to rear and to spawn. So habitat, habitat, habitat. <laughs> I'll just drill that, you know, over and over again. And then I think, you know, what it comes to, you know, so anything we can do, you know, to, um, you know, uh, you know, contact your decision makers, um, you know, make it very clear, you know, that, that you, that you want, you know, a, a salmon filled future, you know, wherever it is, you know, if you live in, in, in salmon country. If you don't live in salmon country and you still, and you love to eat salmon, um, you know, find, you know, these, these wonderful, you know, mom and pop fishery, fish, fishing operations that um, are more than happy to ship their salmon to you. And you will develop a relationship, not only with that salmon, because you'll know exactly where it comes from, but you'll develop a relationship with the fishermen, you know, it's not unlike, you know, uh, farmers markets, you know, getting to know, getting to know, like who's growing your food. And in this case, who's catching your food. Um, there's a wonderful company called Sitka Salmon Shares, and they ship all over um, the, the, uh, uh, the lower 48. Um, the Taku River Reds is another company that I, uh, that I mentioned, uh, featured in my talk. I think there's a website if you go to, I think it's called Alaska, Alaskans Own or Alaska's Own. That's another kind of community supported fishery. And I think there's, there's uh, 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 several um, different companies that you, know, you can investigate there. Um, there's also, there's a wonderful organization called Salmon State. They are Alaska based group, um, salmonstate.org. Uh, they are working um, to safeguard salmon uh, and habitat and ways of life uh, in Alaska. I believe on their website too, I think there's a, a spot called Marketplace or something like that where you can connect um, with uh, fishermen and, and buy directly from them. And, you know, if you're not doing that, you know, wherever you go, if you are buying salmon, ask a lot of questions. Um, I'm, <laughs> I, I, I'm sure waiters and restaurants or fishmongers in the market don't maybe particularly like seeing me coming because I'm going to ask, you know, well, you know, is it, is it farmed or wild? I want to know that right off the bat. If it's farmed, I'm not going to buy it. Um, that's, I know too much. Um, so is it farmed or wild? Um, where is it, where is it coming from? You know, you know, what part of, let's say it's Alaska and they say Alaska, I'm like, okay, great. Do you know what river, <laughs> you know, or what bay or what system? And then do you have any idea how it was caught? You know, because not all fish are caught the same, processed the same. Um, when you get into this, you'll, you'll get to know a lot, but, um, uh, again, habitat, and then just be very cognizant of when you're eating salmon, where it's coming from and, and how it's caught. I put the links for um, Alaskans own and Salmon State in the chat for those who are interested. Um, Gigi asks, how do you feel about the role of aquariums in advancing salmon conservation? Ah, well, aquariums can play a great role in educating, you know, all of us um, about the salmon life cycle. Um, you know, if you don't know salmon, you don't know their you don't know what they need, right? You don't know that they're starting fresh water, they go to the ocean, they come back. The fact that they come back to their, their birth stream, I mean, to me, that alone is just like this incredible feat of nature. You know, that you have you have salmon like out in the ocean thousands of miles away from where they were born. And at some time, at somehow, at just the right time, they make it back, you know, to the the very, not only the very river and stream system where they were born, but usually the very stretch of that river and the, or that stream system where they were born. They don't just, you know, come back and spawn anywhere in that river. It's pretty much right where they were born. How do they do that? Well, that's what a, that's what an aquarium can educate 
all of us about. Um, and, and, you know, the other thing you saw some, some photos in there of the salmon eggs, you know, when they're, when they've, they, when they've got the eye developing and then the next stage is called the Alvin. It's that little tiny fish with the, the nice little yolk sac attached to it. We would never see those two stages of life in the wild because those two stages of life happen um, under beneath gravel in the nest that the, the parents uh, dug for those fertilized eggs. So we'd never see those. And so in an aquarium, you probably can um, see those. So I, and I think that's super important, you know, that when we are learning about the salmon life cycle that we hopefully can see every stage and to see them in that little egg, that eyed egg to me is just incredible. And then the Alvin is my favorite because I think I love the name Alvin, <laughs> but I just think they're so adorable at that stage and they're tiny, like they're no bigger than my thumbnail you know, at that stage. So you know, aquariums can play a wonderful role, um, basically in, in educating us about the life cycle and then in, you know, what to say I'm need. Well, thank you so much for um, being here, Amy, and sharing your work as part of Momentum 2021. Just wanted to sign people to the um, links that we've posted in the chat, letting you know that the Salmon Way is available for purchase at Eagle Harbor Book Co. here on Bainbridge Island, as well as through um, its publisher, Mountaineers Books. And we've also uh, posted the Salmon Way website for those who might want to learn more. Um, as a free museum that relies on our members and donors, every dollar counts. So if you'd like to support BIMA and Momentum, um, we'll put a link in the chat to do so. Oh, great. I, again, I really, really appreciate um, uh, BIMA for uh, making this possible and so appreciate all of you for tuning in. Um, I know this, this past year has not been easy you know, for any of us. And um, it's still, again, very strange for me to connect with all of you, even though I can't see you or, or hear you, but I, I feel you. <laughs> and, I, and I really appreciate the opportunity um, to share, um, you know, these incredible stories that I was so fortunate to, to go out and, and experience. So, so thank you. And I will say, um, I have to, have to put in a plug for the book. Um, Mother's Day is coming up. Father's Day is coming up. Makes a great gift. Um, and, and what I found is even if people maybe don't think they're that interested in salmon, these stories resonate on a much deeper level with people. So even for maybe the non-fish lovers in your life, uh, they might like it. So that's my plug. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for being here. We're so happy to, to host you, Amy. And um, oh, it looks like Tom says thank you again for your work, story, and passion. It's a wonderful note to end it on. Thank you for everyone who participated uh, via the Q&A as well. Have a wonderful evening. Bye. Bye. <laughs>